So on behalf of the European chapter of the Society for Psychotherapy Research, my name is Uli Kramer. I'm a past president of this uh, organization. I'm really very delighted to see everyone um, for our uh, second webinar. We have already met in March, and now it's the second time we we uh, we are uh, have the privilege to meet and, of course, a new people join and so forth. Uh, for this new webinar today. Um, this webinar is really the fruit of a work group I would like to acknowledge. Uh, and some of you are there. I, I see Larissa and uh, a few other colleagues who have been, and Katerina, of course, and you know, um, Larissa, who is translating today for us into Ukrainian. It's actually the channel Portuguese for technical reasons. Um, don't be too confused about that. So welcome everybody, heartfelt welcome to this webinar. We have had the first one on therapeutic presence, I believe for some were still available to watch. And also uh, we also wanted today to have a webinar on a topic that may be a little bit more at the heart of the research that we are doing when we're um, looking at the effects of psychotherapy. So we weren't, uh, you know, of course, uh, there's one expert in Europe that we uh, really wanted and we're very happy to have him here today. It's uh, Professor Stig Poulsen from the University of Copenhagen at the Department of Psychology uh, in, in uh, Denmark. So welcome Stig, uh, Professor Poulsen is um you know as expert in uh, lots of research and lots of experience in assessing psychotherapy from a variety of perspectives uh he's he has been looking at you know change when patients with bulimic disorders uh have done psychotherapy or also looking at um psychodynamic variables across psychotherapy. He's himself a psychodynamic psychotherapist and will be teaching on um, choosing the right measure in psychotherapy. It's such a crucial question. I'm really delighted to listen to him today. Of course, uh, Professor Poulsen is also past president of the European chapter of SBR. I'd like to leave him uh, the stage right now. Is there any technical things we need to do before or just start? Any? Larissa, all good? Okay, turn it over to Stig. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am delighted, somewhat humbled uh, by being here to, together with you. I'm overwhelmed about the attendance and I just, of course, want to express my sympathy for for the situation that you're in in Ukraine and and assure you that Denmark stands united behind your fight. And if if this can somehow show some kind of solidarity with with the situation you're in, I'm more than happy that we could be here and and have them really happy that you have organized this initiative. So I will share my screen um, and go on to my presentation. So in a minute, you will have to tell me if you can see my screen. I just have to do like this. So does it look all right to yes, you? Yes, it's good. Thank you. No, good. No. Super. Mm -hmm. So yes, everything's good. Okay. Very good. Thank you. So um, I heard that at the last um, seminar you had Sherry Geller uh, speaking about presence in psychotherapy, and I'm sure it was really engaging from a clinical point of view. I am a little concerned that I may not be quite as um, emotionally engaging uh, because I've chosen a topic that is admittedly rather dry, and that is how, what kind of outcome measure should you use for evaluating the outcomes of psychotherapy? But even though it is perhaps a little bit dry, it is definitely really important. So I will just, you know, let you have it. I, I'm sure that a lot of you are clinicians. Uh, some of you may be psychology students. Some of you may be researchers. I hope this will be relevant in some way to all of you. 
So as Uli said, I am professor of clinical psychology and psychotherapy uh, in Copenhagen. And what I wanted to do was to give you sort of a, a broad introduction, uh, an overview, so to speak, of measures that are relevant to monitoring the outcome of psychotherapy. And for that matter, also for other psychiatric treatments. So I'm not gonna tell you about uh, psychometrics, you know, the quality assessment of, of uh, instruments, at least not very much. I'm not gonna talk about the statistical issues in outcome measuring. I'm simply trying to give you some rules of thumb, uh, some guidelines for how to choose um, instruments and what considerations you might want to have uh, when you try to choose uh, outcome measures. So I'm gonna talk about a lot of different measures uh, belonging to different domains and used for different purposes. But even though I'm going to talk about a lot of measures, there are so many more out there. So the measures that I will tell you about are only examples of instruments that have been widely used. They're not necessarily the best, um, but they belong to uh, those that you might consider using for the specific purpose and concept that you have. So before I go on with the instruments, just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective. So um, the, the, the discussion about outcome measuring can be seen within the context of the discussion of evidence-based practice versus practice-based evidence. So first of all, I would like to say that I am uh, so old that I do remember when psychotherapy was um, considered something that was, you know, um, very experimental, um, definitely not an integrated part of psychiatric treatment, something that was frowned, frowned upon a little bit, uh, at least uh, by many uh, psychiatrists. And the position of psychotherapy and mental health has luckily uh, changed dramatically over the past 40 years. And at least in Denmark, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure about uh, Ukraine, but at least in Denmark and in large parts of, of Europe and the United States at least. And probably the most important reason for this change is that a lot of research has been conducted. And this research has systematically been testing the outcomes of psychotherapy with well-established measures and this has resulted in uh, several psychotherapeutic approaches being designated as evidence-based. So even though this is not the only um, way to do research to focus on what uh, approaches are evidence-based, what, um, what types of psychotherapy should be used for specific disorders, it is something that has had an enormous importance in terms of establishing psychotherapy as um, a well-accepted approach to psychiatric and psychological treatments. So today, the ideal for evidence-based practice um, is often expressed with uh, these three overlapping circles. So evidence-based practice is usually defined as um, using the best external evidence, and that is the evidence that has been provided by these types of control studies where you measure the outcomes in a valid way, but also to have this evidence combined with uh, the clinician's individual clinical expertise and being mindful of patients' values and expectations. So it's not just about implementing specific um, evidence-based interventions. It is doing this, but um, with an eye for the specific context and the specific characteristics of the client. So another approach to research um, is what has sometimes been termed practice-based evidence. And that is um, research that is based on a systematic measurement of outcomes of psychotherapy that is conducted in real life settings. And this will sometimes be at a therapist level or it might be clinics that gather together uh, evidence. And this is sometimes, uh, is typically not controlled, not randomized controlled trials, but more um, observational studies, more naturalistic studies. 
but it still provides a huge amount of information about psychotherapy, about the outcomes, and often also about the processes of psychotherapy. And this kind of research may be particularly relevant to those of you who work as clinicians and who might perhaps even be interested in monitoring the outcomes of your own psychotherapies. So, so outcome measurement is not only something that happens in um, as part of large research projects, it's also something that you can do within your clinic as an individual clinician or um, as a group of clinicians working together in a clinic. And I'll come back to that. And in this way, evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence may supplement each other and both approaches may yield valuable research findings. But essential to both approaches is that you have standardized and validated outcome measures and that you're able to choose the right measure. And this depends on a lot of different factors, which I will try to share with you. So among these factors that impact what measure you should choose um, is the first question would be to ask yourself, what is the overall objective of my outcome measurement? So do I want to use it for research? And if I want to use it for research, do I want to use it for um, what may be seen as the evidence-based type of research? It's a little bit more top-down. You have hypotheses about the efficacy of a specific psychotherapeutic approach, for instance. Sometimes you may even obtain some, some funding, some financial funding for the study. You have a large, a uh, sample of patients, they are ideally at least randomized, uh, and there's uh, an experimental group and a control group. And if you're lucky, you will find um, a result that can perhaps even um, document or, or uh, strengthen your, your belief or your, your, the evidence for a specific type of psychotherapy. And if you want to learn more about those kind of studies, you could, for instance, uh, get this great book, um, The Bible of Psychotherapy Research, Bergen and Garfield's Handbook of Psychotherapy and Behavior Change, and look into the chapter um, by Barkin and Lambert on the efficacy and effectiveness of psychological therapies. If you want to do a little bit more practice-based evidence, um, you might also want to consult a chapter in this book. It's one by Louis Kessengay and colleagues that's um, focusing on practice-based evidence um, and on findings from routine clinical settings. So if you want to, to um, use the instruments for research, um, you may sometimes also have the resources for, um, for, for um, having, for instance, research assistants, you may recruit, pay, recruit patients uh, and may be perhaps even able to, to give them a small financial compensation for completing um, questionnaires, for instance. And you may have sort of a larger assessment battery that you want to use. Um, you may have another objective, and that may be that you do not necessarily want to use the outcome assessment for, um, for research, but you might want to use it for quality assurance. And this quality assurance can be at a service level, a clinic level. So it may be that um, a municipality, a region wants to evaluate um, does the psychotherapy that is pro provided or psychiatric services that are provided, well, do they um, produce results um, in the way that you would want them to do? But you may also, as an individual therapist, want simply to monitor, well, how, how do my clients uh, fare? Do they actually improve the way that, you, that, that I, I want them to and, and that I perhaps feel that they actually do? And, and this is really relevant because um, quite a quite substantial amount of research shows that even though um, a lot of us actually feel that we're doing a really great job, job with our clients and obviously are that, then sometimes the results of, our, of the, the ther psychotherapies in terms of, for instance, symptom reduction is not necessarily as uh, impressive as we would want it to be and perhaps as we sense as well. 
So to systematically monitor your, your um, clinical practice and see if, if clients actually do improve the way that you want them to do can be really an eye opener for you and can uh, help you um, try and, and experiment with, with um, um, perhaps changing your uh, psychotherapeutic practices, perhaps you know, getting more supervision or whatever you would want to do in order to improve your psychotherapeutic practice. And this is also really relevant with regard to um, the specific purpose of um, our commissionment that would be to produce data um, that can be used for feedback to clinicians and clients. And I'll come back to this thing about feedback um, because this is something that is uh, really interesting. How can we use uh, routine outcome monitoring to, to, to continuously allow clinicians to um, gauge whether their clients actually do improve and to uh, establish some kind of measures with clients that do not improve in the way that you would want them to. So all of these things um, are relevant if you want to choose a measure for psychotherapy. And, and all of this is also very related to the feasibility um, of the measure. So you might want to have a perfect measure that can uh, illuminate all the dimensions of some kind of outcome, for instance, uh, depressive symptoms. But then you might realize that if you want to have that measure, um, then it will be very time consuming. And this may not be realistic within the context that you're in. So you would want to look for a measure that's briefer and more realistic to use, for instance, in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And of course, you will also want to have a measure that is available. So which measures are translated? Can you actually perhaps um, translate measures, um, perhaps together with colleagues? Some measures are actually costly. You have to pay a fee for using the measure. All these issues you have to look into as well. And then the most important thing about uh, choosing a measure for psychotherapy is probably um, Obviously, what does this measure actually focus on? What does it measure? So there are actually a lot of things that could be relevant to you as psychotherapists um, to know more about in terms of uh, the outcome of psychotherapy. Because outcomes are obviously often thought of as symptoms. So if you treat a patient for depression, then you want to know, do the the depressive symptoms actually decrease during treatment. Um, but you might also be interested in the social functioning and the quality of life of your clients. So you might see that uh, the depressive symptoms do not necessarily decrease all that much, but you can see that the client actually has been able to go back to work. Um, you, you can perhaps see that the client will say, well, I realized that I can actually have some quality in life even though I still fight with uh, my, my tendency to depression. So outcomes are more than just symptoms. It's a broader concept than that. Another thing that you might be interested in is, uh, or are symptoms or are, are measures that actually measure something that is specifically relevant to the type of psychotherapy that you use. So, if, for instance, you work as a psychodynamic psychotherapist, then you might have the sense that, of course, um, it's important to help a client with his or her symptoms. But the, the aim, the overall aim of psychodynamic psychotherapy is something that's larger than just um, getting relief for symptoms. It is much more about personality change. It's much more about um, helping the client uh, being more open to experience, um, having more trust in relationships, and so on and so forth. And this means that you might want to have specific measures that are designed or suited for the kind of psychotherapy that you actually provide. And so I'm going to show you in a little while um, some of these instruments. Then you might want to have individualized measures um, measures that are actually measuring the specific problems that the specific client have. 
Um, you might be interested in satisfaction with treatment, which is something different from outcome because you may actually be really satisfied with treatment without having much symptomatic uh, change. And overall, you might be specifically interested in uh, measures that can be used for routine outcome monitoring. Uh, I just mentioned briefly that in a clinic, as a clinician, you might want to systematically and repeatedly monitor the outcome of psychotherapy um, and get feedback about, well, how is the patient developing? And there are specific measures for that. So all of these domains, all these symptoms will take up um, the main part of, of my lecture, which measures are there for each of these domains. Um, I just have to say that when you choose um, an instrument, you also have to be wary of from which perspective do you want to gauge the, the symptoms of the problems? Very often what we do uh, when we evaluate outcome, we use questionnaires or self-report measures. Simply because those are the easiest to use. You can hand the, the patient uh, a piece of paper where you have 25 questions and the patient will circle um, answers on a scale from zero to four, for instance. That is like the most used use format. These days, um, it's becoming uh, increasingly normal to have these questionnaires uh, in an app format uh, so that you can fill in the questionnaires online, which makes them much more feasible to, to the clients. Um, but sometimes you might want to have a trained observer to evaluate um, how are, the, what are the outcomes of psychotherapy? So what is the status of the client before psychotherapy and after psychotherapy? And for, for a lot of um, different disorders, um, an, an observer may have a more valid picture of the condition of the client. Um, for, for instance, personality disorders, you might not be sure that the, the client will be able to have um, a reliable report of his or her own um, problems. Um, if you want to have an, an assessment of, of uh, psychotic disorders, it can be hard to, to um, have clients reporting the outcomes themselves. And therefore you might want to train observers to use rating scales. You might also want to ask relatives, for instance, well, what is the, how, how do you experience that the client functions uh, at home, for instance, or you might want to talk to professionals, to teachers, et cetera. So again, when you choose a measure, you have to be wary of which perspective, uh, from which perspective do you want um, to have the report on the condition of the client. So finally, um, you would also want to consider um, psychometric aspects of the instruments. This gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, this is not the focus of my presentation. So I just want to, to say that you can have a measure that uh, looks like the perfect measure for what you want to, to evaluate, but it may not really measure correctly the phenomenon that you want to, to uh, look at. And this means that you have to look into two aspects of uh, the measure two aspects of measures, uh, psychometric properties. Um, and those two aspects are the validity of the measure and the reliability of the measure. So very briefly, uh, in terms of validity, you want to, you may check, and that's not you who would check that, but you would want to look very much into the articles reporting of the psychometric properties of the measure. So have they checked for, for instance, predictive validity, which would be an answer to the question of whether the, the score on the measure at baseline, for instance, would that be related to the outcome of therapy? So, so does the measure measure something that has an impact on future aspects of the client's life? You might want to see if the measure um, actually is in agreement with another measure of the same phenomenon. So sometimes you have measures, you have questionnaires, and you want to see, what well, do they actually measure, for instance, the symptomatic status of eating disorders or depression or whatever um, in a way that is very similar to the, the, the results we get from 
a structured interview. And if you can actually have a, a questionnaire that can measure symptoms just as well as a structured interview, it's obviously much easier just to give the client uh, a questionnaire. You also want to, to make sure that the instrument covers all relevant parts of the construct it aims to measure. So um, if you want to measure psychotic symptoms, then if you only measure positive symptoms and not negative symptoms, then you don't have a measure that has high content validity. And overall, you want basically the measure to behave like um, the, what the theory says a measure of the given construct should behave. So you might want, for instance, a measure of, of depression that is, you know, that, that detects patients that are identified as depressive with a very high uh, probability, but that would not necessarily um, have uh, identified patients with anxiety as having low of depressive symptoms. So you would expect it to be relatively high on, on anxious symptoms, but not uh, just as high as on the depressive symptoms. And then you also would want to look into reliability. Um, um, and you may remember from, from your training as psychologists that there are these various types of uh, reliability. And um, these all these things will be reported in, in um, in, in, in the articles reporting results of the, of the measures. So now let me try and show you how this can be done. So first I would want now to look into these different types of outcome assessment, these domains of outcome assessment and start first with the instruments that focus on symptoms of the various disorders. So what we have uh, here are, first of all, measures that try to give a global picture of uh, all the symptoms that a patient have. And perhaps the most well-established measure uh, of, of sort of global psychiatric symptoms is the Symptom Checklist 90. It was originally known as the Hopkins Symptom Checklist. And there are loads of different versions, um, typically a 90 item version, but there are also uh, many briefer versions of it. And the really, really many studies of psychotherapy that has reported the results of the, of the, uh, of the um, study um, as the score on the global severity index of this uh, instrument, which is simply the average score of all these 90 items. And it's also uh, uh, a measure that has nine different subscales. So it's a subscale on somatization, obsessive compulsive symptoms, interpersonal sensitivity, and so on and so forth. So there are um, a possibility to have more specific symptom profiles. Um, these subscales tend to correlate really highly. So if you're high on somatization, then you're typically also higher on the other subscales. But there is to a certain extent a, a possibility of getting a profile on, on what are the more specific problems of the client and how do they, um, do, are they all reduced during psychotherapy? And it's a, a questionnaire that is simply uh, scored on a zero to four scale where you ask the patient, how much uh, were you bothered over the past week? Uh, by, and the first question would be headaches. So not at all uh, would be zero and um, extremely would be four. And then, you know, so a score between zero and, and, and four would be somewhere in between. The client fills that in, then you're asked about how much were you bothered by nervousness and so on and so forth. So this gives some, uh, a relatively global um, assessment of symptoms. And there are loads of other of these um, questionnaires, um, a relatively popular uh, um, questionnaire is the CORE that is developed in the UK, uh, which has 34 items and the uh, outcome questionnaire 45 uh, developed by Michael Lambert and his colleagues in the US. And then there is um, a questionnaire that has been used increasingly uh, recently, um, called the 
patient health questionnaire, anxiety and depression scale, um, which actually has two sub measures, one on depression and one on anxiety. And this is quite interesting because you may realize that in the UK, there has been a major overhaul of um, mental health services in the sense that psychotherapy has been rolled out nationally as um, the treatment of choice for less severe mental disorders. And there's been uh, implemented a step care program um, starting with, with um, sort of very, very um, non-resource intensive uh, interventions such as internet-based therapy or um, counseling. And if this doesn't help, then you get a more intensive treatment like psychotherapy um, or counseling provided by um, people that have longer expertise. And then you may, if you don't um, benefit from this, you may have like specialist treatment by psychotherapy experts. And all of this has been evaluated by these two uh, subscales, the um, PHQ-9 for depression and the GAD-7 for anxiety. And it's been used in Norway as well. And in Norway, they have actually conducted uh, um, a proper randomized control trial of how does this approach to psychotherapy rolled out uh, in large scale in psychiatric services or in municipalities, well, how does it perform um, compared to standardized treat to, to the standard treatment, to the treatment as usual? And it has been documented that during this, um, I uh, improved access, access to psychological therapies inspired uh, intervention. It helps people um, a lot more than what than the services that, that were used before. So if I remember correctly, I think 57% of the patients uh, in the prompt mental health services actually um, responded to therapy as opposed to 37%, I think, in the control group. So this is based on this very brief questionnaire, which can be used after each session and therefore it can also be used to track um, how therapy develops uh, over time. So you might also, besides these global instruments, you might also want to have more disorder specific measures. And these exist for almost every uh, psychiatric disorder. Um, so one of the most um, commonly used instruments for a specific uh, disorder is the Beck depression inventory. And the Beck depression inventory is a questionnaire that consists of 21 different um, areas or, or items. And for each of these items, you can rate um, between zero and, th and three, um, to what extent is this a problem to you? Um, so you have to state how you've been feeling during the past two weeks. Um, for instance, regarding uh, the feeling of sadness. So if you do not feel sad, you circle zero. And if you feel so sad or unhappy that you cannot stand it, then you choose three. And this inventory, like many other inventories, have um, cutoff scores. So as a rule of thumb, you would say that if you have a score on this instrument from zero to 13, then you would only have minimal depression or no depression at all. Um, 14 to 19 would be mild depression, 20 to 28 would be moderate depression, and 29 to 63 would be severe depression. So you cannot use this instrument of this type of instruments to um, make a psychiatric diagnosis, but you can use them to uh, gauge the severity of, of the depressive symptoms, and you can use them to monitor, well, do these symptoms decrease over treatment? So, like the Beck depression inventory for anxiety, um, very often the Beck anxiety inventory is used, and but perhaps even more popular is the state trait anxiety inventory, and this instrument is um, consistent consists of 20 items that assess uh, state anxiety. So the questions would be right now, at this moment, um, how do you feel? 
So do you feel tense? Do you feel worried? Do you feel calm? Um, but you also have questions regarding state anxiety. That would be, so how do you generally feel? So do you generally feel that you, for instance, worry too much over something that really doesn't matter? Or do you generally feel that you're content, that you're a steady person? So this gives you the chance to measure both if like the more fluctuation, fluctuating feelings of anxiety change over treatment, but also if these more ingrained uh, trait-based um, feelings of anxiety, if they also diminish during treatment. So for the PTSD area, um, there's been several instruments over time, but my sense is that there is a growing consensus that you would want to use um, as a questionnaire what has been termed the International Trauma Questionnaire. This has been um, developed uh, specifically for the purpose of, of being useful uh, and in accordance with the organizing principles of the ICD-11, the new diagnostic system, system that's being rolled out by WHO. And it's relatively brief. It has 12 items, six items that specifically focus on the PTSD symptoms and then six items that focus on uh, the new disorder, the complex PTSD symptoms, um, which are uh, besides the, the sort of traditional PTSD symptoms um, that considers disturbances in self-organization. So, and besides that, you would have six questions about the impact of symptoms and functioning. And you can actually have some kind of um, diagnostic assessment using this instrument. So there is an algorithm for um, giving a, a, at least an idea about whether the, whether the patient actually meets the diagnostic criteria for PTSD, but you can also um, have severity scores that can be used for outcome assessment. So perhaps I should have a, a small pause here and just take a few questions. Um, so I don't know if I think I will stop sharing my screen for just for a minute and, and ask you if there's somebody who have thoughts, considerations, questions. Any questions so far? A lot of information. Yeah, there's a lot of information. I know. So this is this is the hard stuff. Um, but uh, I I hope I hope you're hanging in there. Anyone who would like to ask a question? Or to say, continue, should we continue without a question? Anybody maybe react? Hello. Uh, I'm sorry I'm without video. I don't have a uh, possibility to have a video now. But I can tell you that as a um, PHQ, the uh, depression scale and get seven is... Uh, a very common use like I see like clinical uh, psychologist in Ukraine now. And also I recommend to my uh, patients when we uh, uh, end already our therapy, uh, some um, online uh, automatical these uh, questionnaires so they can monitor their state by themselves. And if they see that it's going worse, so they can uh, go uh, and ask for help or uh, continue therapy. Uh, we have a very nice um, online uh, site from Czech colleagues, uh, Samopomic uh, CZ, and they have there these, um, these questionnaires uh, that in Ukrainian language and uh, people can just do it by themselves to screen their psychological state now. That's amazing. So, and, and perhaps you could write write uh, a, a link to to the instrument or some information in, in the chat. Uh, for Yes, for of course I can do it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so perhaps now that I have you and, and the rest of you um, out there, so 
how how um, how common is it to to monitor outcomes uh, routinely uh, in Ukraine? Just you know, I'm curious about that. I'm not familiar with with the psychiatric and psychotherapeutic practices in the Ukraine. Was it a question to everyone or Natalia actually, in particular? Actually, I think it was a question to everyone. I'm not sure okay. whether it was translated. Yes. Okay. Maybe it should be translated. If somebody wants to answer by chat or raising your hand or, you know, there are multiple ways of answering or intervening. We have the answer in the chat that it's typical, especially now. Not I have raised my head already. We recently, the amount of objectivation of clinical research has not been such uh, obligatory and such mandatory as right now. Clinical psychologists at their working places wrote uh, uh, their conclusions, but they researched those uh, 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 those mental processes or functions that were important for psychiatrists, you know, or just to, to understand our results and consequences. But now we have lots of rehabilitation centers where the help is provided for people with PTSD, where the help is provided for people with depressive reactive disorders, uh, where the help is provided uh, for people who have some uh, worries about losses. And that's why the amount of such structurized uh, surveys, questionnaires that can show dynamic of the condition, uh, it gets into rehabilitation center. For example, the person stays there for one month and it is very important to objectify the uh, change in his or her condition. That's why we have it more and more now Practically all rehabilitation centers do not now have such questionnaires. They are widely used and they become, you know, obligatory conditions of uh, something that can prove effectiveness of uh, psychotherapy. That's why, because of all the uh, all the uh, events that are now happening in Ukraine because of the war, because of this popularity and massive usage of uh, psychotherapeutic help, uh, the questionnaire as proof of effectiveness has been used uh, more and more widely. That's our current truth. Yes. Thank well, you. I, I, thank you very much. And I, I would imagine that there is also um, a huge um, strain on the resources of the psychiatric services. So, so that would also Im imply, um, I would guess, that you would want to have um, effective psychotherapies and hopefully uh, relatively brief psychotherapies, which of course should be balanced uh, to the severity of the conditions that, that I would assume that a lot of people are in. So it, it sounds as if it's, you know, that's really a practical need for assessment uh, due to the, the very unfortunate uh, circumstances. Okay, but I, I, as I hear it, it's definitely uh, a practice that you're familiar with. It, it, it may be less familiar to um, clinicians in private practice. I'm not sure about how how you use the, these these types of outcome measures are, but we may get back to that because if I continue, at some point we'll get into sort of how to use um, these measures in in um, as an individual practitioner as well. Any, any more comments at this point? Okay, I think I will um, move on then. And share my screen again. Just to, so. So, um, while, while this was um, examples of uh, questionnaires, there are uh, another approach to outcome measurement that is based on having trained readers rate the severity of symptoms. And perhaps the most widely used um, rating scale worldwide is the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. So 
you have a manual for structured interview um, that you apply to patients with depressive symptoms. And for each of 17 items on the full version of the scale, you rate from a scale to from zero to four on to what extent does the patient, is the patient characterized by, for instance, depressed mood, being sad, feeling hopeless and helpless and worthless. Um, and you would rate to what is, is, is these, are these feelings absent? Um, are they only indicated if you sort of specifically ask about them? Or are these the feelings that are fully dominant that this is the only feeling states that the patient reports spontaneously or verbally or non-verbally? So this measure has been used, as I said, very widely. Actually, um, a lot of psychometric studies seem to indicate that there is a six item version of the Hamilton D depression scale, which actually works as well, has the same psychometric properties as the full scale. Um, and those, these, these are with the six domains of depression that can be termed the core symptoms of depression, which are uh, depressed mood, uh, guilt feelings, um, reduced um, ability to work and to be engaged in activities, um, psychomotor retardation, psychic anxiety, and somatic symptoms of general sense. And as with the um, Beck depression inventory, the Hamilton, at least the 17 uh, item version has cutoffs. So um, no depression at all would be a score from zero to seven, mild would be eight to 16, moderate depression would be 17 to 23, and severe depression would be 24 and above. And as you are probably familiar with, there are endless amounts of uh, studies, psychiatric studies, um, both with um, psychopharmacological treatments and with psychotherapy that has used the Hamilton depression scale, um, both to see if uh, the, the, the rate of symptoms uh, uh, is reduced, but also to see what percentage of patients are actually without depressive symptoms. So how, how, what, a, what, a, what a rate of patients are actually at a score between zero and seven and thereby defined as not having depressive symptoms anymore. So they would have recovered. So another instrument that I've been using quite a lot uh, is the eating disorder examination. So the eating disorder examination is a scale that uh, inquires into eating disorder symptoms, so thoughts about um, how, how worried are you about um, control of your eating, how worried are you about your weight, to what extent um, do you have, for instance, um, uh, binge eating symptoms, so do you often eat um, large, um, large portions of food um, within a limited time. And, and of course, with these types of instruments, you would also be really interested in, well, if a patient says, well, you know, I, I eat a lot of food, um, and then you would want the patient to specify, so, so what do you eat then? And some patients say, well, I eat um, 50, 50 grams of smoked salmon for, for, for breakfast and the same for uh, lunch and the same for dinner, then you would say, well, this is not what people would usually consider to be a large amount of food. But if the patient says, well, I eat two liters of ice cream and uh, a whole um, toast bread, for instance, then you would say, well, this sounds like um, like a, a binge eating episode. But, but the eating disorder examination also gives you uh, four subscales on to what extent do you feel restrained, to what extent uh, do, you, do you try to restrain your eating, to how concerned are you about uh, what you eat, um, how concerned are you about your shape, and how concerned are you about your weight. So another, another rating scale that can be of interest to you uh, and which has been developed uh, relatively recently is um, the sister instrument to the International Trauma Questionnaire. And that's the International Trauma Interview, which is structured just the same way as the International Trauma Questionnaire. So like the, the questionnaire, there are six questions, or six items that focus on the core um, uh, PTSD symptoms and six questions that focus on 
disturbances and self-organization to, to see if the patients also have developed complex PTSD symptoms. So there is um, a lot of research going on into to these uh, instruments and they seem to have surplaced some of the more um, traditional instruments in this area. So the thing is, as I mentioned before, you do not necessarily only want to focus on symptoms. You might also want to focus on social functioning, on the quality of life, um, on, on these domains as well. And there are a lot of different scales that sort of fall into uh, this overall domain. So among the self-report uh, questionnaires, one that has been used quite extensively in psychotherapy research is the inventory of interpersonal problems. So the in inventory of interpersonal problems is a questionnaire that has either 64 or 32 items. And these questions all begin either with, it's hard for me to, and you know, it might be, for instance, it's hard for me to be firm when I need to be firm with other people, that is. And other questions begin with, these are things I do too much. So it might be, I trust other people too much. All of these items deal with problems that you have in interpersonal relationships. And the IIP is interesting because it is scored on eight scales and these scales that lie within um, the interpersonal circumplex. So the interpersonal circumplex is um, construction that has two axes. So there is a horizontal axis um, that goes from being too friendly to being too cold. So you may um, have, have problems that are related to being self-sacrificing, nurturant. So you might, for instance, say for something like this, um, I let other people take advantage of me. So this might be a problem. And uh, you might have problems being too cold. So that would be problems like, um, I find hard to, to uh, I, I often find that I dislike uh, other people. Then there are other types of interpersonal problems that lie on the vertical axis. Um, and that is having problems being either too dominant uh, or being too submissive. And the, the thing here is that this is based on the interpersonal uh, circle, which was originally uh, developed by Timothy Leary, who later uh, became very famous as um, the LSD um, prophet of, of the 60s. But before he, he had that kind of uh, career change, he actually developed the interpersonal circle, which is based on these two axes, the affiliation axis between being too friendly and too cold and the dominant axis uh, between being um, dominant or submissive. And uh, Leary and other people with Leary um, had the idea that any kind of interpersonal interaction can be scored within this, um, this circumplex um, or within the circle. So that you may be both dominant, but also quite friendly. And then you might, for instance, be, or what is termed here as being experienced as intrusive or needy. You may also be, uh, tend to be cold, but non-assertive. And then you would perhaps have problems uh, with being too inhibited. But you may also be cold and domineering, and then you'll be more like vindictive and self-centered. So the interpersonal the inventory of interpersonal problems gives you a profile of a client, shows you um, in what domains do clients have problems? Do they tend to be um, domineering uh, and cold? Do they tend to be self-sacrificing and non-assertive, or so on and so forth? And you also have the possibility of scoring these two axes. So are you overall more friendly or more cold or are you overall more dominant or more submissive? So this is of course an interesting scale because it's not only about symptoms in sort of the, the more psychiatric way, it's also about interpersonal style, interpersonal um, problems and the way that you function in relationships. So this is also uh, an outcome uh, assessment scale that might be more interesting for, for psychotherapists that do focus on um, relationships, relational issues, and not only on sort of symptoms in a very narrow way. So another self-report measure that, that 
reports um, social functioning and quality of life is uh, the WHO5, which is a very simple scale. It can be downloaded easily. And it's about um, um, well-being. It's a well-being scale. So it simply has five items and it focuses on well-being. So to what extent have you feel felt cheerful? To what extent have you felt calm? To what extent have you felt active and vigorous? And so on and so forth. Um, but of course, this is not only a well-being scale, it's also a scale that tends to correlate quite highly with um, depressive symptoms. So uh, if you do not have these feelings at any time, then you are probably also quite depressed. It's a very easy scale. It has very good psychometric properties and has been used uh, for quite many uh, psychotherapy studies as a um, primary or secondary outcome. So the, the, the measurement of stress is also really important in psychotherapy. Um, and probably the most, the most uh, widely used scale is Cohen's perceived stress scale um, that has 10 questions, very easy to use. Um, it focuses on, for instance, in the last month, how often have you been upset because of something that happened unexpectedly? Um, how often have you felt that you weren't unable to control the important things in your life and so on and so forth. So um, you have cutoffs as well for uh, which scores would be determined, uh, designated as low stress, moderate stress, high stress. And again, uh, unfortunately, a scale like this might cover probably some of the, the, the general sentiments that uh, would be the norm in Ukraine these days. Um, but it is also something that, of course, it could be relevant in not only in psychotherapy research, but also uh, as more general measures of um, public health, for instance. So another very widely used scale is the Sheehan Disability Scale. Um, it's super simple. It simply has three items. Um, and it focuses on to what extent do the symptoms that you have impact uh, your um, social and work function. So this is really interesting because of course you, 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 it's very interesting whether patients do have a large symptom load, but it's also really important to what extent they can function even while having these symptoms. So this is basically about do symptoms actually make it impossible for you to go to work or school? Has have the symptoms disrupted your social life? Uh, and has it have they disrupted the family life? So this may for some be more important and valid measures than uh, the symptom issues themselves. So more global measures based on clinician ratings and not on self-report um, have been de developed and they have been part of uh, at least the uh, American uh, Diagnostic Sims System, uh, DSM-4 and uh, now DSM-5. And in uh, DSM-4, the previous version of the American uh, Psychiatric uh, Diagnostic System, there was this uh, scale called the Global Assessment of Functioning that was actually included as an axis in DSM-4. <laughs> And it focuses on social, occupational, and psychological functioning, and it's rated by the clinician. So it's um, a scale that goes from zero to 100. Um, and if you're on the top of this scale, then you are extremely well-functioning. So you would be have superior functioning in a wide range of activities. Uh, the life, your life problems never seem to get out of hand. Uh, you're sought out by others because you have so many positive qualities and you don't have any symptoms. So this is obviously not very common, uh, not uh, among patients and not among any of us really. Um, but then you can uh, rate, uh, you can find ratings that sort of reflect more serious problems. Like for instance, if you have score between 40 and 31, then you would have perhaps impairment in reality testing. You might be illogical in your communication. You might be unable to go to work, to school. You might have problems in family relations and so on and so forth. So this 
scale was um, intended as a scale that could be used for, again, assessing functioning rather than symptoms. So, of course, it's important to, again, measure symptoms, but you also want to measure functioning. And the problem was that this scale was shown to have really limited reliability. So basically, um, clinicians had, uh, relative, had very different ideas about um, what would constitute a score between 40 and 31, what would constitute a score between 70 and 61, and so on. So, so it has been replaced. Listeners, I'm sorry, somebody's microphone is unmuted and I can't hear you at all. Yeah, okay. it's good now. They're muted. You can go Thank on. You sorry. Much. Thank you. Um, so, so the global system of functioning has been replaced uh, uh, in DSM-5 um, by what has been termed as an emerging measure that's called the HUDAS, the WHO Disability Assessment Schedule. And it actually is, exists as a self-report scale and as a rated rating scale uh, that's rated by an interviewer very much in the way that the International Trauma Questionnaire and Interview constructed. And it focuses on six different domains that are essential to functioning. So um, how is your cognitive functioning? Do you understand uh, what other people say to you? Can you communicate? So to what extent are you mobile? Uh, are you able to um, take care of your self-care, hygiene, dressing, and so on and so forth? Um, can you interact with other people without um, having problems with them? Do you attend to your responsibilities, less your work in school, and can you join in on community activities? So this scale has a uh, markedly better reliability than the global assessment of functioning and is probably um, intended to be the new uh, internationally used scale on the measure of uh, disability and reduced functioning. So for those of you who, who work um, uh, and subscribe to specific approaches to psychotherapy, you might, as mentioned uh, initially, want to have outcome measures that actually focus on um, dimensions of problems, of personality aspects that are central um, to the therapy that you are working with. So a lot of instruments have been developed either as outcome measures of uh, specific psychotherapeutic approaches or um, as more general scales that seem relevant to these specific approaches. So for instance, if you work with metacognitive therapy for depression, then um, the central focus of metacognitive therapy is rumination, the tendency to um, ruminate and the tendency to um, worry about rumination. So what would be relevant if you wanted to specifically test the outcome of metacognitive therapy would be to have a scale for rumination because it would be in a sense a proof of concept of uh, the, the theory behind metacognitive therapy if uh, metacognitive therapy was particularly um, effective in terms of reducing ruminative symptoms. So you would perhaps, if you, um, if you work with metacognitive therapy, you would be interested in using a scale on rumination for uh, outcome assessment. <clears throat> so lo and behold, there are several scales uh, on rumination. Probably the most widely used is the ruminative response scale, which has now been reduced to an eight item version scale but it's basically a questionnaire where uh, the client is told that people think and do many different things when they feel depressed and that they should reach each of, each of these items and to see if this is typical of the, the way they act and react when they're depressed. And then the patient can rate uh, if she almost never, sometimes or often or almost always thinks about how alone you feel things, I won't be able to do my job if I don't snap out of this. Think about how fatigued you feel, how 
everything aches and so on and so forth. So basically, is it typically of you to ruminate about the problems that are in, in your life? This would be the, the core target of metacognitive therapy and therefore relevant to that kind of therapy. If you are a practitioner of dynamic psychotherapy, then you might want to see, um, could you find an instrument that would um, measure to some extent the more uh, central um, expectancies and patterns of interpersonal relationships. And some of us uh, who work with dynamic psychotherapy have been very interested in um, scales that measure um, attachment patterns. And probably the most well-established instrument for, um, for measuring attachment patterns as a self-report measure at least is the experiences and close relationship scale, um, which uh, has two subscales. So there are 18 items that focus on attachment related anxiety or what some people term preoccupation and 18 items that focus on avoidance. So items that would measure uh, the um, tendency to have problems about being uh, too distant from other people, the anxiety uh, that you might feel if you're not close to other people, could be questions like, or, or statements like, I'm afraid that I will lose my partner's love. I often worry what my that my partner will not want to stay with me. I often worry that my partner doesn't really love me. So these are questions that would, would indicate that you have a very strong need to always be extremely close to other people. On the other hand, you might have problems about um, being uh, too distant from other people, to be avoidant uh, uh, towards interpersonal relationships. And that would be registered by a scale that has <coughs> items such as, I don't feel comfortable opening up to romantic partners. I prefer not to be too close to romantic partners, or I get uncomfortable when a romantic club partner wants to be very close. So if dynamic psychotherapy works as it should, you would um, find it likely that um, you have better scores on these scales after psychotherapy than before. And this has, uh, to a certain extent at least, been demonstrated that it actually does uh, work that way. You may also have, for instance, you have scales for schema therapy. So schema therapy is uh, an extended version of cognitive behavior therapy, focusing on uh, the core beliefs of patients or the schemata. And um, then you have um, a questionnaire that measures um, 18 specific negative schemas in a 90 um, item questionnaire. So you would have um, items for like, for instance, I feel that people will take advantage of me, which would be uh, a sign of a mistrust uh, or abuse schema. You have items like no man or woman I desire could love me once he or she saw my defects, which would be uh, significant for patients that have problems uh, in terms of having a defectiveness or shame schema and so on and so forth. So the essence here is that if you have a psychotherapy that focuses specifically on um, changing or moderating a person's core beliefs about themselves, uh, about this, the schemas, then you would also want to have measures that actually focus specifically on, so how, how does it go? Do you have less problems in terms of problematic schemas uh, after therapy than before? And this goes for, for instance, mindfulness-based therapy. There are uh, measures for mindfulness uh, as well. So you also have rating scales. And some of these rating scales uh, are relevant for, again, for different types of psychotherapy. So I've, one of the things that I've been working with myself is the reflective functioning scale. And the reflective functioning scale is actually extremely time consuming. I just have to say that. Um, it is a scale that is that, that requires that before you you rate reflective functioning, you do uh, an adult attachment interview. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the adult attachment interview, it is uh, an interview that asks the patient to um, uh, to to 
give adjectives about uh, attachment figures um, and to, to give um, and then to, to um, elaborate on. So why did they say, for instance, that my, my mother was warm? Why did they say that my father was protective and so on and so forth? And based on uh, the linguistic qualities of, of the, the, the speech of the patient, you can rate uh, to what extent the, the patient is securely attached or more um, preoccupied or um, dismissingly attached. But you can also um, rate reflective functioning. So reflective functioning scale, it codes patients and you can actually have a score from being exceptionally reflective to being decidedly anti-reflective, not wanting to reflect about what goes on inside yourself or what goes on inside other people's at all. So to my mind, um, reflection and reflective functioning, also known as mentalization, um, would be a really interesting phenomenon to study because as a dynamic psychotherapist, because you would um, expect that dynamic psychotherapy leads to better reflective functioning and leads to a higher mentalization. Um, it may be problematic though to focus on this as an outcome measure because it's very difficult to administer the adult attachment interview twice. It's hugely time consuming and, and patients sometimes find it rather stressful to, to um, be interviewed here with the AI and to do that twice is sometimes something that patients really do not like. However, even though we, we, we had these problems in the study that I did, we actually um, used the AI three times over a two year long therapy and um, rated the reflective functioning. And it turned out actually that uh, change in reflective functioning, so improved reflective functioning was actually related to better outcome in psychodynamic psychotherapy, but not at all in cognitive behavior therapy. In cognitive behavior therapy, therapy, actually the reflective functioning diminished a bit, <coughs> um, but it turned out that you could actually have a, a, a diminished uh, reflective functioning in cognitive therapy and still have great results. But in dynamic psychotherapy, um, a positive outcome was distinctly related to improved reflective functioning. So this in a sense is the proof of con concept that reflection and improved um, access to your own feelings and self uh, understanding is a core change mechanism in dynamic psychotherapy. You also have for um, assessment of, um, of your therapy um, generally, but something that may be really interesting to dynamic psychotherapists as well. You have um, what is called the Patient Attachment Coding System, the PACS, which was developed by Alessandro Talia. And this is a hugely interesting measure because it identified patient attachment patterns um, based on transcripts of psychotherapy. So you can actually rate psychotherapy transcripts and you can do that with any kind of psychotherapy, not only dynamic psychotherapy, but also for instance, cognitive behavior therapy. And you can look for markers for um, the extent to which the client is proximity seeking towards the, the therapist um, says things that are intended to um, maintain the contact with the therapy with the therapist, but also whether the, the, the client is actually curious and trying to sort of think out aloud and in that sense sort of tries to explore and, and uh, reflect on um, new subjects. But then you can also score to what extent is the client avoidant uh, towards the therapist, um, avoids having a more close relationship to the therapist, or conversely, if a client is resistant to distance. So if the client constantly wants to be really, really close to the therapist, perhaps in order not to reflect or explore uh, the problems. This can be coded reliably based on psychotherapy transcripts, and it actually corresponds to the results from uh, to the categories of, of attachment that you get from the 
uh, adult attachment interview. And you can also use this, at least to a certain extent, as an outcome measure because you can see whether the, the patient's uh, discourse during therapy actually becomes more secure, um, which would, of course, indicate that there is a development in the uh, perhaps more uh, global relationship patterns of a client. So um, finally, in terms of these rating scales that are relevant to, to specific types of psychotherapy, uh, a very well-established, uh, relatively old measure is the experiencing scale, um, which is perhaps um, is particularly relevant for person-centered and humanistic approaches to psychotherapy. So the experiencing scale um, is a rating scale that describes seven levels of how emotionally and cognitively you are involved in your own ongoing experience. So are you in touch with yourself, with your uh, experience? It's a bit like the presence concept that uh, Sherry Geller, uh, as I understand it, uh, discussed with you uh, at the last seminar. So the experiencing scale goes from one to seven and at the lowest level of experiencing, you would uh, have a client that talks about events, about ideas, about other persons, but never really talks about, so what goes on inside the client? What are the client's emotions or feelings? And you know, gradually at the higher levels, you have clients that refers to themselves but do not express emotions. Uh, you have clients that focus more directly on emotions and thoughts up to sort of the higher levels of experiencing where he, the client really explores uh, his or her inner experience and reflects on this experience, but not in a sort of abstract intellectual way, but uh, in a manner that uh, shows that you're sort of deeply in contact with your inner world and emotions. So this scale would also be something that designates improvement in the sense that improvement is conceptualized specifically within, for instance, humanistic or person-centered approaches. So this is another approach to outcome measurement to have these specific types of changes that are supposed to be essential to specific types of psychotherapy. <clears throat> so before I, I turn uh, to, to the last, um, Domain, which would be what would you want to use for more um, clinical purposes on a day to day basis? I would also say that there's been developed uh, instruments uh, that are individualized in the sense that you ask the client, for instance, when you use the target complaints, you ask the clients simply, so what are your problems? And please rank these problems. Uh, and you ask the client typically to write down, so my most uh, pressing problem is this and that, that you know, I feel very alone in my life. And then you ask the client to rank, often on a scale between uh, 12 and zero. To what extent is this, um, to, is this a problem for you? How much discomfort is associated with this specific problem? And then what you can do is that you can give the client the same specific wording of the problem after treatment and ask the client, so now you've been in treatment, so how, how much discomfort is associated with this specific problem now? And you would know not necessarily whether a lot of symptoms have changed, but instead quite specifically what, um, what happened to the main thing that the client formulated herself as her specific problem. And a more, a more um, in a sense, advanced uh, approach to individualized outcome measures have been developed by McAlevey and the Norwegian psychologist Christian Molchi. Um, it's called NORSE, and uh, I have left the, the, um, uh, the website uh, here uh, for, for those of you who, who would want the slides subsequently. And the interesting thing about this uh, measure is that this is a measure that adapts to the individual client's problems. So when you start psychotherapy, you get 102 questions or items. These 102 items are loading on lots of different scales. So there are actually 23 different subscales. The thing is that after you have filled in the questionnaire the first time, 
then there is an algorithm that um, calculates. So do the client have, have problems on all these different domains and dimensions and scales? And if a type of problems is not relevant to the client, then you throw out most of these items and don't use them subsequently. You only leave one item. It could be, for instance, about eating disorders. So if, if the client apparently doesn't have eating disorder problems, then you just discard the eating disorder scale. You leave one item because then you can monitor through therapy if at some point eating disorder problems actually become active in the client. If this problem becomes active, then you reintroduce the other items that focus on eating disorders. So you have a measure, and the thing is that you can actually use this measure after each session, and then the therapist gets feedback about, so how is the progress in the client's symptoms, and only those specific symptoms where the client actually seems to have problems. And you also get information about whether new problems have actually arisen because then uh, the system registers that, oh yeah, the client didn't usually have eating disorder problems, but actually it seems as if she has problems with, it, with, with, with eating uh, at the moment. So furthermore, it also includes um, questions about therapeutic alliance and questions about whether the, therapy, the, the patient has specific needs in therapy. And since the, the therapist gets um, a structured overview of the client's scores after each session, the therapist uh, to a large extent knows, so is the client progressing as she should be? Are there specific areas where the client is not progressing? Or are there actually some new developments, uh, negative developments in symptom areas that haven't been a problem before? And furthermore, is the is the therapeutic alliance okay? And have, do the do the therapist formulate specific needs that they want to to um, the, the therapist to address? <clears throat> I just skip the slide. And this brings us to the final uh, dimension that I want to to touch upon, which are um, the feedback uh, measures. So these days. Um, Feedback in psychotherapy has become increasingly uh, important. And probably the most uh, used measure is the outcome rating scale, the session rating scale developed by uh, Duncan and Miller. So these are extremely easy to use. You simply ask the client before each session to fill in these four, to rate these four items um, on this visual analog scale, simply put a cross. Uh, to the, to, uh, closer to right if you have huge problems within uh, this domain and closer to left if you don't have any problems. And you ask the client simply to, to say over the last week, um, how have you been feeling personally in relation to the family, in relation to work, and in terms of, sort of general sense of well-being. This allows the, the therapist to get an overview of is the client progressing or is the client actually deteriorating as opposed to what happened uh, in the last session? And after each session, the client fills in four questions on this visual analog scale that focus on the relationship to the therapist, on agreement with the therapist on goals and topics, on whether the client actually feels that the approach and method is okay and what the overall feeling about the session was today. So this allows the therapist, gives the therapist an impression on how are things going and allows the therapist to immediately on a session to session basis, address whatever problems there seems to be in the uh, development of the psychotherapy. So this approach called feedback informed treatment has become highly popular and is to a certain extent at least documented as uh, an approach that contributes to better outcome of psychotherapy. So an alternative approach to this uh, is the OQ45, which is somewhat more resource intensive. So this is an instrument where you have 45 items that are used after every session. And there is um, a, a, a software package that calculates 
for, uh, for each client, depending on um, what was the symptom load uh, at baseline, calculates what is sort of standard recovery um, curve or pattern for clients that have a specific um, baseline score. So you would expect clients to improve, um, but not necessarily improve uh, with, at the same rate if you have very low symptoms initially or if you have very high symptoms initially. But then for individual clients, if their symptoms do not follow this positive development, if clients actually do not get better or even get worse during the treatment, then the therapist receive feedback that you have a client that do not improve as you would want them to do. And these patients that are not on track, they receive a further questionnaire that monitors alliance, their motivation for change, their extent of social support, critical life events. And then the clients receive their scores on these instruments and also some advice on how to deal with these problems. And again, this is um, an approach that has been documented as improving outcomes. And of course, particularly improving outcomes for patients that do have these off-track um, off curves. Um, so now I'm going to stop here because uh, we're very close to the end. So I'll unfortunately have to skip my, my last uh, slides. Um, this is just a reference to a study that I've been doing myself where we have been using some feedback, but if you get the slides, you can just check out the article. There's a reference to it. Um, so I just wanted to say to you that here at the end, I have given you some references for further reading. And if you are interested in using any of these scales, if you need specific references to them, you're always free to contact me. You can simply write me an email at this email uh, address and um, I will either give you the information myself or put you in touch with those who have developed the instruments. So thank you very much for your attention. And we may have time for just one comment or question uh, from the audience. Thank you so much, Steve Olson. This has been so stimulating and just listening to you, I found that, you know, um, this is so much within everyone's grasp, maybe also, even when you work as a clinician, that some of these scales can be used. And if we can contact or some of the Ukrainian con colleagues can contact you, it will be very, very helpful, um, maybe to get some resources. Just because of time, of course, if you have questions, please raise your hand. I just want to give one note of information. We don't want to go too much over time. Uh, that is the information about the upcoming conference in Dublin, which is the uh, conference of the Society for the Psych Psychotherapy uh, or, or, uh, SPR, uh, so the Psychotherapy Research, next week. You can see it starts next Wednesday. There is actually, interestingly, um, a module that's also online. I know in the current situation in Ukraine, oh my God, this is difficult to travel. I, we have talked about this earlier with some of you, and it is now possible to actually join online. Some of you may be traveling. I heard there has been interest, and others uh, may uh, want to be there online. It's it's a very clinically relevant and really, really helpful conference, I think, if you want to learn about the updates of psychotherapy research, right? It's not just the very complicated statistics, but it's also very, the, you know, how you can include, as Dick Paulson taught us today, a measurement in everyday practice. And the good news, the president of the SPR has uh, waived all um, registration fees for any person from Ukraine. So if you are interested to attend, uh, either come to Dublin next week or you can attend online for free, right? Go on this website, psychotherapyresearch.org and you can join us we will all be there i believe michael uh, stig and myself and others uh, who will be presenting our newest research and it is for free only for colleagues um, from ukraine it is our way to stand by you to stand by ukraine in this extremely difficult situation any 
final thoughts. Of course, we'll be back after summer break with another webinar. And Michal, maybe you have more information or you want to say a few words before we close. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Stig also from my end. I'm so grateful for to you doing this. This is extremely stimulating. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Uli. Thank you, Stig. Uh, I think it was uh, a, a very interesting presentation that put together actually a, a vast amount of knowledge considering psychotherapy evaluation and the way it is done. Uh, and I would like to invite you uh, for the next seminar that will be held within this initiative. Um, the title will be Now More Than Ever, Self-Care for Ukrainian Mental Health Professionals. And this seminar will be given in September uh, by Professor John Norcross from the United States of America. So um, feel free to join and also to spread the news. Everyone from Ukraine is welcome. Everyone interested in psychotherapy research, who is also a clinical psychotherapist, but not only. Also those who do not clinically do psychotherapy, but are interested in research can join. So spread the news. Uh, and uh, the initial date is uh, September 11th. And I think if we are able to keep that date, we will try to, to do that uh, on that time, the same probably time as this seminar has taken place. So all of you, please feel invited. And to what Oli has said, I would like to also thank from my um, side, um, uh, from the SPR for Ukraine initiative, to the executive committee of SPR for the waiver of the fees. I think that it's very important and please do join us online in Dublin. Uh, Stig has given you a very nice introduction to what SPR is all about. So uh, if you are interested in the newest advancements in psychotherapy research, join us in Dublin. Uh, online, it's very easy, it's well organized. So. I really do look forward to seeing some of you participate. And the program is vast. If you look at the program, those are hundreds of presentations. So go on the web page. I will write the web page on the chat and, and take a look at how psychotherapy, the Society for Psychotherapy Research, how large it has become. Thank you. Thank you. So this closes our event today. Thank you for your participation. You are close to our hearts. And of course, uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was extremely useful and extremely interesting. An amazing job again. So I hope you will continue to support the Ukrainian colleagues and us also in organizing the further events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And um, bye bye. I hope to see some of you online or perhaps in person in Dublin. And thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Я, конечно, сами, блин, по-русски, брат, два слова, сказали.